Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Joshua Shigala co-founder of The Standard at thestandard.io. Thank you so much, Joshua, for, for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me, Monica. It's fantastic. Uh, I hear your accent. I'm wondering, where are you located right now? Well, I, I'm, I'm actually Australian. Uh, I was actually born in Berlin, grew up in Australia, back in Berlin. Uh, I just call myself an earthling at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. I didn't hear the Australian. I heard what I thought was a bit more of like a some sort of a British, but I, I understand now. This this is just me having no idea what I'm hearing. So <laughs> I've had to tone down my my Aussiness for the uh, for the Germans so they could actually understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, I know. I can see people need to tone a lot of things down for the Germans. You know, it's just my father. <laughs> my whole family is you know of German heritage, and that you know stiff upper lip and and that need for precision is uh, it. it permeates most everything, including now I see even one's, one's dialect and accent. So. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. My goodness. That's great. Um, so the, I want to talk about the standard a little bit because yeah. um, I, I know that we can, we can pick on a lot of centralized um, structures and currencies throughout this conversation. And that's of course what I love picking on. So I'm all, I'm all in, but, um, I also, I just wonder, you know, how centralized, what type of centralized, I think, uh, because I'm based in the States and so many of our listeners are based in the States. We often ignorantly just end up with this sec United States centric, uh, view. And a lot of times that, that leads the ir- arrogant sort of barrage of regulation and problems that we run into in crypto. So we can, we can still blame it on the sec because they cause plenty of problems, but it sounds to me like when you talk about regulation and, and centralized, um, currencies and governments and, and regulations in general, you're not really just focused on what's happening in the U S you're looking at a broader issue of regulations that are kind of meddling in a space that maybe they don't have a, a real reason to be. Yeah. I mean, I, I really come from, from the, the sort of early crypto people who were obsessed with changing the system. And the reason why Bitcoin was invented in the first place was to remove central authority from the ability for two people to, to transact um, free, freely and have a win-win situation, like a typical uh, in a typical free market sense, where in that moment there's a win-win and people do a trade and hey presto. And, and I, I find that a lot of the issues that we talked about, including inflation and and everything uh, leading up to Bitcoin. Um, are kind of built into the stablecoin structure as well as the CBDC structures that's that's being pushed against uh, pushed upon everyone now. Like, oh, CBDCs, how fantastic! But they're extremely dangerous for human freedom, um, uh, and and you know, human freedom and what we've built. Um, it, it, it goes all the way back to the Magna Carta. You know, we, we've we've really taken a long time to get this freedom that we have now. So to start to really fall into uh, a, a lot more control grids as we turn into a more of a technocratic society. You, we really have to be careful on what we choose as technologies that don't enslave us more, but rather free us and make the weak uh, more private and and the the powerful more transparent. And this is really the the, the way you want to move forward. Make the weak more private and the powerful more transparent. That uh, that. I have not heard it said so in such a succinct manner before. I love that. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> yeah. I hope well, I stole it from somewhere too. So that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. So when you um, when you say these are very dangerous things, that, you know, to have a centralized government issued 
uh, basically fiat pegged stable coin. First of all, can you tell uh, some of our of our listeners may be very new to crypto and, and many of us, of course, are not. So we know st- what stable coin means. And to talk about an al- algorithmically stable, stabilized stable coin is a different thing, which is going to be interesting mm-hmm. in and of itself. But to first kind of set the ground here, the groundwork, what makes um, a, a fiat pegged and a centralized, uh, centrally distributed stable coin a dangerous thing in crypto specifically? So if you go back in history, when, when people were walking around with gold and silver in their pockets, well, generally silver, because the gold was for more elites, kings and queens, and silver was for the plebs, you know, for the normal people. And, and, and so it, it was very heavy to carry around gold and silver, plus it's a bearer-based instrument. So if you get robbed, it's kind of, um, you know, terrible. So um, what people did was they go into, into vaulting facilities, they drop off their silver, they'd get a certificate, and the vaulting facility say, you've got uh, 20 grams of silver and here's a certificate. And then I, instead of on the way to the market, instead of going to the vaulting facility, I would just say to the market person, hey, if you give me that watermelon, I'll give you the certificate. And, and therein started the paper money route and, and everyone was happy with this paper money pegged to silver um, and gold. And very quickly, the vaulting facilities were like, hmm, not everybody's going to come and run to us and withdrawal at the same time. So let's just start writing more receipts than we have uh, gold for and ask interest for it. So they're all of a sudden they're printing money out of thin air and they got so wealthy from this that people would really uh, be amazed at the estates that these bankers, these huge castles and, and mansions that they, you know, no Kings and Queens would ever be able to afford that. And, and so, um, so, so, then after that, the French Revolution would happen. Uh, these revolutions where they start cutting off heads, and people are like, "Hey, hey, can we just calm down? Stop cutting off people's heads." Um, it, 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 look, it's really um, not a good I tell look. You, <laughs> it's not a good. It's definitely not a good look. Um, I tell you what, we, you let us as voting operators and bankers continue doing this, um, giving receipts out and uh, charging interest for it, and we'll give you a cut as creditors. So this is where interest starts coming from and fractional reserve banking. So that became the legal structure of, hey, let's have less on deposit than we have out there floating around in a legal state. Now, a lot of these centralized stable coins, let's, uh, let's say USDC or Tether, they, they, they say they have $1 sitting in a bank account and for one ERC-20 that's floating around. And, um, and that's, that's fantastic. It's all great and good, but there's certain things that can go wrong with that. Uh, one is that you have to, tr- there's, there's like four levels of trust there. One is that you have to trust the software, the software that you store your keys in, that that doesn't get hacked, it doesn't get changed. Then the second level is you've got to trust the issuing company. Are they just printing tethers out of nowhere uh, uh, and, and, saying they have less or are they, uh, where are they, you know, yeah. then you have to trust the bank that they're storing all this money in. Is there going to be another financial crisis where they collapse and it takes all this economy with them on in the, in the digital space. And then you've got governments where those banks sit. Are those governments going to say, Hey, there was a big transaction on the dark markets with these stable coins we're going to freeze the entire lot um, right. or we're going to generate our own stable coin and make you illegal. And, and so if you look at these, these multiple attack vectors, um, they're very, very scary. And not only that, if you have a company and you can print as much uh, infinite numbers as you like and buy rare numbers like Bitcoin and Ethereum with those infinite numbers, you can basically start to control and manipulate the market on this rare asset market. And so there's multiple existential threats to the crypto industry by having these centralized power structures um, uh, be so powerful. I mean, we, we got told by JP Morgan Chase that they have now categorized Tether to be up there with BlackRock in terms of purchasing power. Like wow. it, it's, it's gone insane, right? Wow. Wow, that's amazing to think of Tether being on par with BlackRock is, you're yeah. right, that is alarming. That's very alarming. So when I think about the standard, and I am i do not know a lot about algorithm, algorithmically uh, stabilized coins, 
Yeah. What I do know of them, and this is where I'm going to say the wrong thing, and then you get a chance to totally correct me, um, <laughs> which is it. my favorite. So <laughs> it sounds to me like there's there's a whole bunch of math involved in trying to create something that's stabilized on its own and that has a more transparent issuing sort of protocol behind it than this tied to a fiat system that hopefully can remain buoyant and stable even amid other currencies, even fiat currencies falling. Now, the only algorithmically stabilized coin that I've ever had any even just brush with was years ago with the basis coin. And I believe they raised a bunch of money and then they something went wrong and they had to give it back or they, the project went away. But that was the only time I had a founder sit down with me and say, here's how it goes. And it was the first time I'd heard someone talk about an algorithm being in charge of a stabilization. Now, I think that must have been a bit of a different um, concept. I'm sure there's many ways that you can you can slice the algorithmic, you know, like little pie up to make it to make it affect a coin or not. But how exactly yeah. do you guys use um, what, what algorithm? Like, what are the things? What are the pieces that you bake together to make yeah. a stabilized coin on its own? So I, I, we're, we're moving away from a pure algorithm to stabilize, but let, let's back up a little bit. Um, DeFi as the concept, decentralized finance was, well, it was started by Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the first decentralized financial instrument that we, we sort of, I mean, gold, I guess, <laughs> as well as decentralized. But, but in the digital realm, we have Bitcoin. And then, but th later on, DeFi was started by a, pretty much a, a, a protocol called MakerDAI. And um, MakerDAI is, is, a, it was, is a, an absolute amazing structure. What we've done is taken that and, and uh, uh, we feel we're the next generation of that. So, so what, what we're doing is um, we're taking the idea of a financial instrument like a, like a, like a USD and creating something that's backing that with real assets. So what does that mean? That means to, cre to mint um, a stable coin pegged to the dollar or the euro or the yen or the shekel, or whatever you're after, what you want to do is throw money into a, uh, throw, throw assets into a smart contract. And for your listeners that don't know the div, what even is it, they hear this thing, smart contract, and they're like, what is a smart? If you, if you, it's no different than a computer program. A smart contract is nothing but a computer program. The only difference is a computer program generally sits on one computer. The problem is if the one computer is dealing with money, meaning like Ethereum or Bitcoin, you can't trust the output of that computer. It might have been hacked. It's, it might have a virus on it. You can't trust that what's coming out of it is truth, uh, so to speak. So. What a smart contract is, is a computer program running on thousands of computers around the world, all calculating the exact same thing. And 51% of those computers have to have the same output. And that's when the network goes, that we're going to consider as truth because, you know, I mean, it's usually a lot more than 51%. But the fact is hackers just couldn't hack every single computer. And, and so what, what we do is we allow people to, um, we create a smart contract. We allow them to hook Bitcoin in, Ethereum, and physical gold. And we can talk about that later and how that works. Um, uh, tokenized physical gold into these contracts. And then um, this is a very volatile uh, package, right? But you can borrow or generate from yourself up to 50%, or actually we're going to 85% of the value that's that's in there in a stable coin. So we, we mint another coin and we say, hey, this coin is pegged to the euro, let's say. And, um, and how, that, how that pegging happens is actually quite simple. So this is a debt that you've created for yourself. You've borrowed money from yourself. You've got locked up and to get these assets back, which is over collateralized, you've got more value sitting in here than you've borrowed. You just have to buy it, go onto the free market, buy back what you borrowed and send it back to the contract, releasing the Ethereum, and then you can go and, you know, have fun. So, but how, the, the interesting thing is, how is this pegged to the currency? And it's very, very simple. And we, uh, central banks use this mechanism. What they say is, okay, there's an interest rate attached to me borrowing from myself. Um, it's a small interest rate. And what, what happens is um, if 
the, uh, let's say, standard euro, which we're calling an S euro, falls below a normal euro in price, maybe it goes to 80 cents, the network will vote on lifting interest rates for the next six hours or whatever it is on everybody. And every, some people will go, hmm, that interest rate's just too much for me to bear. I'm going to go into the market and start buying S euro back. This demand of what happens when demand goes out at more than supply is the demand lifts the price, of course, back to a dollar. So it's it's sort of like in the way that the, so we have um, the Fed chairman will come out with, you know, quarterly new rates. And that's just, is it basically what you're doing is sort of similar in terms of treasury buybacks and a debt instrument that is used to help to stabilize an economy. But what you have is something in real time that automatically does it minute by minute if needed rather than quarter Uh, by quarter. So there's a less of a lag time, but there's a similar sort of mechanism at work. That's right. So if SRO starts becoming really popular and it, it might be coming more valuable than the Euro to a dollar, let's say Euro 10, Euro 20, then the system will say, hey, let's lower interest rates so more people start borrowing from themselves and flooding the market with more so it'll come back down. Okay, so so it's not a if, hard... I don't sorry. know if the euro is is subject to the same sort of perilous teetering onto hyperinflation the way the US dollar is. I forgive my ignorance there, but if I was to think of this pegged to the US dollar, um, I would want something that would have buoyancy even, even as the US dollar slips into oblivion, which I believe it sort of is and will continue to be doing. So yeah. as something is pegged to uh, a, a highly infl- inflationary or potentially inflationary um, fiat currency, how is it that you're not just sort of replicating the same, the, the same um, you know, monster in a way? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And, and really the answer comes back into financial literacy. How do the wealthy protect their, va- their wealth during inflation? Asset what do they do? they borrow a hell of a lot of money. They effectively go short the dollar. By borrowing dollars from yourself, you've got real assets. So you've borrowed some dollars. Now, those dollars are inflating away. So effectively, the inflation is paying off your debt because you have to then, if you say you buy a car um, uh, with with your debt, you've borrowed from yourself, you buy a car, and in five years' time, the same amount of money buys you a carton of milk, then you've effectively just borrowed as much money as a carton of milk. And, um, and so this is how uh, the wealthy have always protected their wealth during hi- hyperinflation or inflationary moments. They actually borrow as much of this, this crap that, that is oh, being printed as already. they can. I'm in as much debt as I can possibly be in right now. I'm like, right? You want right. to give me more money? Please do. I will take it all Just day long. Throw it at me and go and buy rare assets. Yeah. Buy, you know, forestry, houses, Bitcoin, Ethereum, gold, whatever you can get that's rare that can't be printed, you want to get. And um, and this is this is what we're doing. So the fascinating thing about this, Monica, that I really love is that you've got an, over, an, an entire economy that's transparently over collateralized. So there's more value backing this thing. Now, if, um, if a debt becomes under collateralized, if the smart contract starts heading towards how much has been borrowed, it automatically um, Could liquidates. Could also be if the volatility of the, the price of these assets goes down dramatically? That's right. So when these prices are going down, you want to either fill up with more or you want to pay off your debt and, um, and then you know, do whatever you need to do. But if it drops down and you've forgotten about it or you don't care because you've already borrowed um, up to the maximum, so you're, you, you know, all you do is you are going to sell it anyway to get whatever you, you needed. So rather than that, you've borrowed from yourself and it liquidates. You've lost like a 5% um, uh, on top of what you were going to sell it for anyway. But um, effectively what you want to do, uh, what happens is the, the smart contract liquidates every, everything that's in it to the governance token holders that, that are holding the, the TST token um, that, we're, that we're distributing. So, um, so really it's a, it's a mechanism that um, uh, it takes what Maker started and uh, works on some of it. You know, they were a pioneer in the beginning, but we feel that uh, they made some mistakes. There's um, a lot of centralization in the, um, in the governance of this mechanism. And there's only one thing, it's the USD, it's pegged to the USD. But the fact of the, what we want to do is the ability for people to mint 
not only fiat pegged uh, tokens, but also, you know, and do the whole lot, you know, uh, pesos and just everything so that there's a mirror in what's now somehow called the metaverse instead of sp- cyberspace, somehow Facebook's rebranded the entire internet. Yeah, how did they do that? I'm not- How did they, what? <laughs> <It's kind Yeah. laughs> Last week, <laughs> they branded, anyway. Um, so uh, so we're doing that, but also that you can then, the DAO will decide, hey, let's also uh, allow people to mint a token pegged to Tesla stock or pegged to, a, pegged to gold or pegged to uh, an indice, the, the NASDAQ. And so you can have then, um, stable coins pegged to a whole bunch of stuff that's sitting there. Of course, you won't get a dividend from Tesla, but you might want to hold that for some reason and, uh, and then be able to pay that back into your debt. So you start to, rather than building an economy based on, on actual uncollateralized debt, where you're backing the whole economy up with force saying, if you don't pay back this debt, you are going to get a black mark against your name or you're going to go to prison for not paying your debts uh, or, you know, all of this stuff. Rather, you promote saving because this is another thing, Monica, that really gets gets my goat is that (laughs) 78% of people in the US, and I'm pretty sure this is globally uh, a very similar number, live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, it's absurd. It's absurd. It, like buy another PlayStation, absurd. stupid, or Game Boy, like buy another, you know, gaming console or VR headset. Don't like yeah. save it maybe because you might need it. It's just ridiculous. I mean, we're the it's, most short-sighted species I can, I can imagine. I'm sometimes I'm like, did the stork get confused when it dropped me off here? Like, how are these my people? Like, they don't even know how to save more than two weeks in advance. Are you kidding me? You know, these are people that seem to be like really heavily invested in absolute vulnerability for no good reason. Like, what's that about? You know? Well, you know, I I wouldn't blame the people rather than the design of the the culture, you know, what of extreme and selling and marketing. And, and I mean, even those who are, who benefit from it in the short term, you would think would finally get the memo that in the long term it's not good for humanity. What you should maybe change the design. And that's why I'm so yeah. excited about to talk to innovators like you, because it's like, this is the beginning of seeing people who have the insight, the ability, the desire, and, and the longer vision to say, we can build something that actually is just better architected for the long-term needs of human beings, not just for me, I'll be plenty yeah. rich. It's fine. And plus I can't <laughs> take it with me anyway. Maybe I want to like, I don't know, make the system better. Just a thought, just a thought. Uh, absolutely. When, you know, when we're lying on our, on our last, on the deathbed, you want to look back at your life and say, I made a difference. You know, that, that's really, really important. I, I, it's, it's, it should be the driver for everybody. Um, unfortunately it's not. Um, but yeah, I, you know, our, our, our token project, it, it doesn't have a picture of a dog on it, um, you know, it, it's, <laughs> but it is Thank a very God. serious infrastructure project. Um, uh, we're also very, very um, much working on the whole layer two solutions on Ethereum. So we, we need our transactions to be subsent in terms of fees. So we're looking at a lot of the technology that's coming uh, from, from a few places. One of the companies uh, is called Starkware. They're building an amazing layer two that's using zero knowledge validity proofs, which are a fancy way of saying um, that there's a lot of cryptographic math into making something uh, making a, uh, a part of da- a parcel of data very very small, uh, so that it's very very cheap to transact, and um, and we're really uh, one of the main things is to have you know when I got into Bitcoin, it the whole thing was bank the unbanked, unbank the banked, and let's let's change the world. Let's have separation of money and state. Yep. Um, you know, th- this is a, a, a large philosophical move forward, just like the separation of church and state to say we uh, are, are free to choose um, who we t- hold value from and, and, and how, as well as what, what deity we, we pray to or, or, or right. choose to um, <laughs> decide to pray to. So, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I feel that the standard is um, is really the next evolution of a sort of sort of DeFi 2.0, and um, and I, I would really love if people came to um, to the standard.io, checked out our, our Discord, and helped the conversation because at the end of the day, 
Um, we are a, a, a loose group of people all around the world build, building this protocol. Um, if you do like early crypto projects um, that are interesting um, and, and not just, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't, they just want meme coins and they just want to go up and the next week sell it and stuff. But uh, we feel that we're a very, um, a very strong, we'll be around for a very long time and building a, a large scale infrastructure for, for a global economy. That's fantastic. So it sounds to me like between the, the Discord channel and the large community, are you operating more and more like a DAO yourselves? You know, we're, we're really young at the moment. And we, came, we uh, started a, the world's first gold to Bitcoin exchange back in 2014. We, we were programming at 15. We launched it. Um, that was after the Mt. Gox collapse, right? Um, the, for those that don't know, this was the very first Bitcoin exchange. And I, I lost a lot of money in that exchange. I was like, how do we, how, how do we make a better exchange? And, and so we launched Voltoro um, because we wanted to build a transparency protocol that to show other exchanges how transparent you can be. And, um, and, uh, and, and so... Uh, th this was uh, a Bitcoin and physical gold exchange where, and it's still going actually. <laughs> it's, a, it's been going for a long time, never been hacked, which is amazing because we're attacked all the time, um, but we know what we're doing. And so that's, uh, that's a real, um, uh, you know, a sign that, uh, that our tech team will, will build something uh, uh, good. But I'm sorry, Monica, I totally forgot your question and started <laughs> ranting about. Are you, um, well, you actually are starting to touch on it. Are you talking about the team and how you're functioning? Are you functioning and you, are you intending and drifting towards uh, developing the company to act as its own DAO, decentralized autonomous organization? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've we've got in the Discord channel, uh, governance channels. We've got um, a bunch of a bunch of channels where people start to decide things. Nice. Um, the next thing is to build um, the smart contracts for that DAO, so people can uh, not only vote but um, to. So, <laughs> one of the things I didn't touch on is that DAOs have a big problem, and um, and that's voter apathy. Uh, people buy these coins and they have a whole portfolio of them. They never go and vote. They never go and actually help uh, do this thing. So they do that in economics, it's called the free rider problem. And, and they just hope that it'll go up and then they'll sell. So when you, uh, when you have, when we have this whole suite of stable coins that need decisions on where the stability fee or the interest rates uh, are set on an hourly basis, we need a lot of people to participate. So one way to do that is, of course, an algorithm. <laughs> yeah. And to touch on what you said right in the beginning is the problem with algorithms are they can be gamed because if an algorithm is public, a smart person can sit there and study it and then play with those. So yep. when, when an army crosses a bridge and all march, you start to get these oscillations and, and you can then tear down a whole bridge. That's why they put the double step in to a march. I didn't to, know that. To break, yeah, so that, that, that breaks the oscillation. Huh. And if you have an algorithmic stablecoin, pure algorithm, a computer program going, oh, it's too high, drop the interest rate. People can start to figure that out, dump, take back, dump, take back, and start to play with the algorithm and then destroy it. So this is why we we really like the human fact because the human ha humans have infinite entropy, meaning randomness yeah. uh, within them to say, "Oh, I know better." You know, we're, wa we're just walking chaos, is what we are. We just <laughs> walk in, like, I know, I'll do this, and then someone's like, "No, no," and it's wonderful. Yeah. Please, right, talk amongst yourselves. Keep talking, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's one of the reasons I don't really believe in the grand conspiracies. Yeah. Uh, it's because there's just too much chaos, like yeah, uh, right. this randomness. But uh, really, uh, yeah. So one of uh, one of the things that we're really imp implementing, and we're talking with some really amazing people along the way, is um, is how to uh, use what are called prediction markets or decision markets. So rather than us voting, um, and there's a lot of academic research that prediction markets are the best way humans have of determining the future, hmm. apart from going and seeing the witch at the local fair that looks in a glass bowl. Yeah, that's obviously the best way to determine the future. But <laughs> always, <laughs> always. <laughs> but prediction markets, what are they? They're basically bets. You know, you bet on which horse you think is going to win. And the odds actually tell us which one's likely to win the most. It's, it's never perfect, but it's, it's got a very 
a good track record of accuracy. And so what we want to do is build uh, futures markets between uh, multiple options. So let's say we need to peg a certain currency and we say, okay, let's build a futures market where in the future, this one trades at this much uh, stability fee or interest rate, this debt, and this debt has a little bit more interest rate. Which one will peg in the next six hours this currency closer to the, 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 the euro? And, and people will place bets and buy these contracts. And then whoever wins, wins whoever lost. So, so if, you, if you see, if you're an expert in, in economics and you think, hmm, this market here, it's way off. Like people are, people are uh, betting on the wrong horse here. Yeah. You can place um, your, your vote, so to speak, and actually get paid for it. And there's an infinite bunch of people always wanting to speculate. So we feel that this is a much better way of scaling decisions, plus getting people not to be so apathetic when it comes to, to actually participating you're in government. Engagement. You're basically making it its own investment strategy to engage its, on its own. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I we mean, could add that to like our general voting system so we could actually get paid to show up and vote and have a higher voter turnout rate. That would be... Fantastic. Well, absolutely. I mean, we see how crap voting is. I mean, you just have to look at some of the talent shows on television and people vote for all sorts of weird reasons, right? The guy comes on and says, oh, my dad died of cancer and this and that. He's a crap <laughs> singer, but everyone votes for him yeah. because his dad died. So it sort of skews incentives. But imagine, right, you could use prediction markets in actual politics. If you said, okay, which president is going to bring the uh, um, the the mean happiness level of the uh, of the country up to a certain scale. Happiness is a hard quantifier, but yeah. let's say the jobs rate in uh, in a year's time, and people place their bets on them. And the funny thing is, when you put money uh, into a decision, you you tend to put away dogmas. So, um, for, for instance, right. you might be a really staunch I don't know Cowboys fan or whatever the football team is. Yeah. Um, but you know, the goalies just screwed his knee. The, you know, the, the guy's yeah. got COVID, the other I guy's love that you got just use goalie in like a football thing for the Dallas Cowboys. I, that's exactly how much I know about sports. And I just, <laughs> I, I, I just yeah, Cowboys. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so when they, when they get to the bat and the hoop and they actually slam dunk, it doesn't work. Right? It doesn't work. No. Yeah. So, so a lot of people say like, I've been at like my whole family down to my father, my grandfather, yeah, we're we all love Cowboys it. Those are our colors or whatever. But then you're like, Oh, yeah, but, but so really is I'm it is a, a complex idea that used to be dogmatically driven and breaking into very small data points and saying, but, do you think that yeah. the contestant with brown hair is going to win the beauty pageant or the blonde hair? And then you go, hmm, well, let's see. Historically, it's been the blondes. All right, we're going to go with that one. You know, and then right. you no longer are like, but she's Miss Minnesota and I'm from Minnesota or whatever, right? It's like, <laughs> exactly. just take all of that out of it. So is it, it really takes- just breaking down a complex idea into tiny little things? It's almost, I don't know if you're familiar with the absurd way of absurd, very, very, very micro oriented way of, of voting that the state of California has Im- involves themselves with and involves all their people with where they have just like these like full on encyclopedia long, you know, voter um, voting ballots because and you have to know every single tiny little thing because you have the chance to vote on every single thing. And as wow. a voter, you don't know. And so you either like get a cheat sheet and find out not that I have done this myself. I've never lived in, in California and voted there, but I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen friends of mine get their ballots. And I'm like, what is that? You know, like a leaflet. Yeah. And they're like, no, it's a ballot. And it's just so complicated. But wow. So from the voter's perspective, it's like you're asking me to be an expert on a million different things. And that's not Mm -hmm. been gamified properly because I just want to basically vote this way, I think. I'm not sure. But I can't, you know, I guess if you were to incentivize me with money, then I would become more of an expert. But also asking individuals to become an expert in more things seems like a difficult task. Like how could you possibly incentivize enough people to become generalist specialists to be able yeah. to know that many data points and provide them. I've, I've really thought about how to gamify engagement. And if, you know, you could say I'm in a pod, that guy really understands squirrels and the government and the, and the environment. I'm just, well, he, vote, he votes. I, he, I, he, get, he gets mine for that stuff. All the environment stuff, you know, Josh was going to be in charge of it, but I totally understand <laughs> how cars should go and infrastructure and rail. So everybody's going to come with me and I get five votes to, for all my you know friends and he gets my vote along with four others. And that's that. I mean, I've thought about these ways of kind of gamifying it around human behavior because it's very difficult to get them and to to incentivize more than just the ones who are interested in trying to become experts, which is still a subset, right? 
Absolutely. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's extremely complex. And so we've sort of outsourced it to say, hey, we, uh, we'll, we'll vote for people that vote for people um, in some countries yeah. uh, because that, that seems to be a way. But, but really, um, voting is kind of hard because we, we have to determine the future without any sort of incentive. And so you can be just propagandized into like a character. A lot of uh, that's why, you know, a lot of uh, the U.S. presidents have been very they've been like a, we, we had a, an actor and Donald Trump was a, a, gay, a sort of a celebrity actor, in himself and, yeah. <laughs> you know, because they're great sort of uh, entertainers. And so people are like, oh, ha, I loved his jokes. I'm going to vote. So uh, we, we you find seen that the movie Idiocracy. It's oh, perfect. It, it's perfect. it's such a yeah. I, I didn't know that that documentary existed, actually. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and as it has existed for so long, I mean, I've seen it multiple times. It only just gets more and more accurate the more times I see it. I know. It's amazing. I, 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 we used to have T-shirts. We ran a, a podcast years ago and the T-shirts was, you know, 1984 is not an instruction manual. And, and that's also on the similar on the similar vein. That Yeah, definitely. Wow. Um, I don't even know where to, how to like wrap this up from there because I'm like, we can just keep going on this down this rabbit hole. But I mean, in terms of gamifying how people are voting for things and getting people to engage, it sounds like from a community perspective, you've got some real legs underneath this with your discord channel and all of that. If somebody was to go, I see the poster behind you. I couldn't, I couldn't not the standard.io. If someone yeah. was to go there, what are they going to find? And what is the first thing they need to do to become engaged with your project? Yeah, I mean, I would say just sign up to the the, the white list. I think it's called now. Um, it's just a list of uh, that you can sign and get emails from. But if you scroll right down to the bottom and read, first of all, read about the project, get uh, you know, understand if it's something you're interested in. Um, it's definitely, um, you know, it's. Uh, I'm not here to uh, at all say investments or anything like that. We're not that. We're a project that is building some some uh, protocol. But if if this interests uh, you to find out more, definitely just go onto the standard IO. All the links are there. Um, the Twitter as well is the standard um, at the standard underscore IO. I think. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, come and say hi. All right. Absolutely. I'm glad that we, uh, that we had this chat and that people have a place to more learn more about this. I mean, it sounds like as I look at the black swan event or events that are on their way to us, not only in the crypto markets with the, you know, next crypto winter, but also the fiat markets where my Lord, you can't print that much money and expect things to go well. <laughs> In the oh, long absolutely. Term, it's just a tough one. Look, so I, I just to, to to quickly touch on that. I just want to make people aware of how large a trillion is because this number gets bantered about so much. So the the US printed three trillion recently. Um, uh, so a, a million seconds is eleven days long. If you were to stand there and count that, uh, a billion seconds is thirty two years. So that gives you a bit of a scope of the order of magnitude from 11 days to 32 years and a trillion seconds is 32,000 years. So the wow. amount of money, and it took the first 200 years of the US history to print the first trillion. And in the first quarter of uh, this year, they printed three more. So uh, for people that don't think there's going to be inflation, and, and by the way, this is a global problem because the rest of the world is going, uh, America's doing what? Uh, quick, can you turn on the printers as well? Because we don't want to be left behind. Right. So everyone's printing along with racing. the US. Yeah, racing. And this is the first time we will see, and we already are seeing a global inflation and, and it'll head to a hyperinflation where we have a massive explosion of debt and horribleness. So right now is the time to get, you know, like <laughs> this is definitely not investment advice, but only hold as much money in the bank as you're willing to lose. They used to say that about Bitcoin, only put as much yep. in Bitcoin as you're willing to lose. Now I say only hold as much in the bank as you're willing to lose because hmm, it's, it's looking, they're totally intransparent. So be careful folks out there. Uh, yep. Just yep. educational and entertainment uh, advice, obviously. I appreciate it. I think that's, that's uh, exactly how I feel. I've been uh, more and more and more. I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just, moving over. It used to be a continental drift. It was a little bit of a balance, this and that, try it out, you know, get in the equities markets. And 
um, trade options, trade all those things and on both markets. Right. But really now I'm like, okay, I want to make sure I'm already set up. I'm already ready to short the markets as they start to tumble because they all will together. Yeah. But I think, you know, she who shorts the best will win <laughs> because it's going down, man. It's not going to do well. And you might yeah, as well, and- you know, play with real money and not, not paper money. That's just going to lose. I mean, even if you short a, a, the equities market really well, as it tumbles, you're shorting it in paper money. That's not worth anything. Who cares? You might as well short yeah. a crypto market. That's going to follow that a bit, just like it did in the crash of 2020, but yep. it's going to recover because it's actually backed by a real thing, which is the yeah. absolute opposite of what you, you know, newbies to crypto think, but we actually have a much better bedrock. Absolutely. That's why when, when, uh, when the, uh, the, the, we had that crash and a lot of people were like, yeah, why did gold crash to me? Because we, you know, we've run the, one of the oldest gold, ex- gold Bitcoin exchanges or the oldest, the, um, uh, and my answer is, well, of course, in that moment, everyone needs liquidity and they're selling whatever they can to be able to cover different of positions. Course. Oh yeah. So Again, everything like the gold goes away when everything needs to be liquidated immediately. Yep. Yep. Uh, but in the long term, when, when, when you have systemic corruption, um, in the long term, you're looking at rare assets, whether that's uh, forestry, bricks and mortar, gold, silver, crypto, um, things that cannot be printed out of nowhere. That's where you want to be holding. If you, if you aren't, haven't got the, the goal to actually short things because you need to be fairly sophisticated to do that, you can do something very simple. And that's just buy rare assets and hold them. Well, and hopefully we'll have tokenized real estate as an as a asset as well that can be traded and held and backed by something real and hopefully added to other stabilizing features as a stabilizing feature to things like the standard. So the, yeah, I'm hoping that we'll absolutely. have more and more places we can put those things. Yeah, yeah we have absolutely. a lot to talk about in the future. <laughs> it's coming. There, there's a lot, yeah. No, the tokenized real estate is very, very interesting space. It's a hard space to crack, very but cool. I think it will. Someone will do it very well. And, um, uh, and it's something that can definitely be used to collateralize in the standard for sure. Absolutely. Well, I would love to have a, uh, a second, a round two with you, if we can do that um, in you know, the sure. next few months. I'm sure we're going to have plenty to talk about as Q1, Q2 of 2022 shows up and uh, all the markets drift the way that we pretty much can see them coming. It's like watching an avalanche in slow motion. You're like, oh God, here's the one more snowflake and that thing's tumbling, you know? <laughs> uh, and people are like, Wow. You're amazing. How did you see this coming? And you're like, how did you not see this coming? Yeah. I don't know. After (laughs) 32 years of minutes, (laughs) 32,000 years of minutes. Come on. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, this has just been fantastic. It's been lovely to hear uh, your thoughts on this. And I really appreciate your, um, your complete and utter uh, similar disdain for centralized uh, currencies. And I'm just very glad to see more and more options and opportunities to get out of them and get into something that also is still stable being made. So thank you so much in early innovator and creator in the space. I just, um, I also, I'm not quite as early as you, but I've got the same sort of, as you have cypher punks there on your hat, uh, I have the same desire just to see a better system built, whether it, you know, it's the, becoming a gajillionaire is not my, my end all be all in life. It's really seeing something actually. It's like, well, yeah, it's to, if, yeah. <laughs> Lambo. What? Yeah. Right. I've nested <laughs> yachts. I feel so special. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> at some point you leave the earth, you might miss it. I don't know. But, uh, um, it's so weird. So weird. Well, but thank you again, Joshua um, Shigala. I always, I'm yeah. always about to just, I'm just about to mispronounce your name every time, but Shigala, I got it again. Thank God. <laughs> all good. All good. Yes. Well, thank th- you so much, Monica. It's been an absolute pleasure. I absolutely agree. hundred percent. We've got to do a round two and uh, we'll be staying in touch. And I guess I'm going to wrap this up by saying this is Monica Profit signing off on the new trust economy. Joshua Shigala and I have had a wonderful conversation and uh, we hope to have it again. So thanks a lot for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks. You've been listening to the new trust economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new trust economy with us.